Hey everyone, I'm here with John Heerman, one of our friends and customers and sales partners in Eastern Colorado. And we're going to be talking, uh, this is a continuation of the fallow fallacy webinar that we did with Nicole Masters. Uh, at the end of that webinar, we indicated that we'd be making some additional videos that showed people who are taking proactive steps to not leave their ground fallow. And so this is uh, one of those videos. Uh, John farms in uh, Haxton, Colorado, the eastern part of Colorado, uh, a very, very dry, very harsh environment. Now this year, 2023, they're actually getting some good moisture. But uh, I've known John for more than 10 years, and more years out of not, they, they are quite dry. So, uh, John, I think you told me you're in about a 17-inch rainfall area. In an area where most people would be doing a wheat fallow rotation, but because of your understanding of soil health and the principles of soil health, you don't let anything lie fallow because you know the value of growing plants and the value of that biology. So I invite John to, to make this video with us to share with everyone the reason that he wants plants growing as often as possible and the reason that he just does not allow land to be fallow on his farm if he can possibly help it at all. So with that, John, I'm gonna uh, just let you give a little bit of your background. You've got a really interesting and unique background. So give us a little background of how you kind of got started farming. Uh, you grow a lot of seed for green cover. You clean a lot of seed for us as well. Uh, as well as, as farming in that area. So give us just a little bit of background, and then I know we've got a few pictures here that we'll share and we'll talk about as well. Okay, yep. Um, I I grew up farming with my dad, and we were in a wheat fallow system um, my entire childhood, I guess. So it, it, was, it was a wheat tillage system. And then, um, you know, I kind of started farming on my own as I got out of out of college and when I moved back to the farm I had just kind of started adding millet and some other things in the rotation but I still had a fallow period to get back to wheat and I was at no-till on the plains in 2013 I believe um, or maybe it, it would have been it would have been the winter nope yeah it would have been 2014 so the January of 2014 and I saw that rainfall simulator that they that the NRCS does, and they had a uh, they had like a a no-till field. I I switched to no-till as well, but they had a no-till field and it had no cover on it. And I was amazed at how much water ran off of that pan and didn't go in the soil. And it 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 really wasn't even that much better than the than the tillage um, runoff and infiltration on there. And once I saw that. I was like, well, what, why am I farming like this then? If I, you know, we don't get that much rain. If you want to utilize all the rain that you get, you better prepare your soil to accept that rain event. So, and it, when I seen that, everything kind of clicked when, you know, when I see ponds and fields in, in a semi-arid environment that, you know, shouldn't be there. It's just a, you know, the yep. soil's trying to tell you it has a, a problem and, there's there's a solution for it so i guess once i seen that and learned some stuff at the conference the, the next three years i kind of immersed myself and tried to find as much information as i could about soil health and building the soil up and you know i kind of discovered that you know the premise to to build soil is that you got to have plants photosynthesizing and and putting complex sugars and stuff into the soil so that you can feed that biology and you can build up your organic matter. And if you don't, if you have long periods of nothing growing in there, you're, you're not really helping your soil or you're not really helping your, your end game, I guess. I'm, since I'm younger, I'm, I'm more looking at the very long, long term of slowly improving my soil. And I guess, you know, this will be year nine that I have done cover crops and you know you when you hear people at conferences or you talk to people about you know the change that it will take in your soil you know when I first got into it I was like oh man one year and like this cover crop is like 
you know, magic. You just plant it and you're going to be the greatest farmer in the world and have the best soil. But, you know, come to find out, especially out here, you know, it takes a good six years to actually um, be able to, you can certainly see the difference right away, but as far as the fertility or monetary value or anything like that, you know, it's, it's took a long time. It's took at least six years before things start to come together. I would yeah. say. And, and, and when you have really dry years, like you've had some of those really dry years, you, you really don't make much progress at all, but then you get a decent year, like what you're having now, and you can really see some quicker gains, I would guess. Right. And like, like, last year would have been the first that's the first year i didn't plant cover crops in the last nine years after harvest um you know our our wheat was just like six inches tall when we when it was to harvest time and we just no forecast for any rain whatsoever and not even the weeds were growing so that last year was the first year i had i had never done anything but it was you know just the conditions yeah weren't weren't there for that but you know nor normally even if it's dry or you were catching a rain here or there i you know i will plant a cover crop because just a little sprinkle will get it going it's just last year's conditions kind of yeah and you know whereas most experienced yeah whereas most people in your area are only growing you know wheat maybe some sorghum yeah how many different crops are you growing john i know you grow at least half a dozen different things just for us but how many different things are you growing out there uh, I, like this year, I I got rye, rye planted by itself. I got rye, rye and hairy vetch. I got some wheat. I got some millet, and I got some oats. And um, I did have some winter peas, but they didn't like our spring winter. So um, yeah, so not as diverse this year. But that's I kind of needed some uh, high carbon crops this year to replace the abysmal last year because I didn't get a lot of residue produced mm -hmm. to cover my soil. And that's one of my, you know, my big pushes out here is to keep my soils covered as much as possible so that I can capture snow in the winter. And then mm -hmm. I can have that residue laid down on the soil surface come spring and, and summertime. So, um, and that's why I don't really have a set rotation. I've kind of evolved it to, meet the needs of what exactly my soil might need um, you yeah. know like a little, last year a little residue crops and you know and planting some millet or something into some wheat stubble instead of you know peas because i i need to get some more carbon out there and and get some straw up to capture things but yeah and you know, i after this year I might be able to cycle some stuff or have a different crop rotation come come next year and not have so many so much carbon based crops, I guess, or. Yeah. And I think that flexibility is really a key because you don't know what mother nature is going to give you. So you just have to be prepared and be ready. And, and, uh, you know, in a, in a really air, you know, after a really dry period, I think you're really smart in going with the higher carbon crops to get that cover because it all starts at the cover, you know, as, as you noted in the rainfall simulator, you know, the no-till by itself is just not going to work long-term. You've got to have that cover out there as well. Right. And I would say, um, like in our area, you know, you you combine your wheat in July. Um, and generally, um, with the no-till producers, I guess, they wait for a rain, wait, wait for a flush of weeds after wheat harvest, that field sprayed, and then it's sprayed again in the fall in preparation to go to corn or millet or something come springtime. So, you know, that's July till next May, usually that, that, yeah, you'd have inputs of just trying to kill weeds and not trying to have anything growing where you got 10 months of there. Um, and so I've eliminated that period. And what that has allowed me to do is not use the amount of chemicals that would be required to go out and kill all those weeds just by getting the seeds in the ground immediately after harvest. I can, you know, pl place good in the soil then, you know, with a shower, even if, if you have enough moisture to get it up right away, you can get ahead of those weeds and let that cover crop do its work. And that has really cut back on 
you know, the amount of herbicide I would have to use. And yes, that cover crop's going to use moisture, but I'm more, I'm looking towards the springtime, towards next year when I can have more residue and actually have done, you know, I look at the herbicide just as a, an expense, you know, but what good did it do for my soil or what, you know, what benefit was it to me or my long-term goals and the, you know, the cover crop, I look more of it as an investment. Yes, I have a seed expense, but I'm, I'm able to photosynthesize nine more months out of the year than I, I would be able to. Um, and so generally I put overwintering stuff in there too, so I can mm -hmm. go, you know, I like, I like staggering my mixes when after wheat. So they're, I got a lot of warm seasons and a lot of cool seasons. So when I get, when yeah. we get frosted off in September or October, my warm seasons are dead, but then, Hey, look, here comes all these cool season brassicas or even the oats hang around for a while. And then, you know, you're come next spring, you got all these winter cereals or some of the brassicas come back and or winter peas or winter vetch. And you can, you know, you can really utilize all utilize the sun, I guess. That was my main thing when I, you know, that's our free resource. And yep. I, I think that's the, I don't think there's any way to build soil without photosynthesizing. So that's where my push is, is to always have something growing. Yeah. yeah and that's great. And, and you're not going to, you're not going to get that if you're leaving it fallow, you don't get the benefit of that photosynthesis. So John, you sent some pictures over earlier. I'm going to kind of pull those up on the screen here because I want you to just share with folks uh, some of what you do in your operation. So you can just kind of, Share a little bit about which, what uh, you got going on here, and we'll just take a little bit of a tour through your farm here. Um, yeah, that that's just my my air seeder there. That that looks like that was a a field that would have um, that was a cover crop that overwintered and had some weed in it. So it that one's just been sprayed off. So that's me planting there in the the spring springtime, and you know it's just a little different compared to the normal normally that would be a barren desolate field with not with you know nothing growing on it and just gray straw or whatever so i so you had you had all I, you had all, all that stuff standing catching snow through the winter shaking yeah. the ground shaded and, and cooler and helping with infiltration right and then what what i like to do is you know, come springtime, I got an overwintering cover crop or I got stuff out there, you know, depending on the year. If it's if it's raining good and it's super wet and it's going to be hard to get the tractor or the sprayer or anything in there, you know, I'll let it go a little longer before I terminate it, before I drill. But if it's, you know, a, a dry year, it's been a dry winter and I'm using up the moisture that I have, then, you know, I will go out there a little earlier and, and yeah. try and terminate that, that cover crop. But sure. um, like for like last, last year was a, a very dry year. And I, I probably didn't terminate it as, as soon as I should have. And it, you know, that, that particular year was a, you know, a live and learn. Yes. I, I should have got that sooner, but I, you know, my thought process, I was building a little residue. I was going to recoup that rain come summertime with, by reducing my evaporation. Well, you know, that moisture never came. And, but by the time the year was done, you know, my crops weren't any worse than the next guy who didn't have cover crops yeah. because no one got anything. So it didn't. <laughs> right, um, right. That recharge never came. So tell us about this picture. You're just uh, getting all geared up to fill the drill here, it looks like. Yeah, that was that was my first year that I ordered seed uh, for every field. I had a lot of wheat back then. I hadn't, I don't know if I'd met Scott yet, so I hadn't started growing rye. So that's all going behind uh, wheat stubble there. So, um, and you know, my I've got better with my mixes or do what's tailored for the soil or in my behind wheat. I generally don't do a lot of cool season grasses. Um, do a lot of broad leaves and you know that's one thing that's hard to get into my rotation and get into my soil as a warm season broad leaf so cover crops in the summer allow you a great opportunity for yeah. sunflowers and buckwheat and all sorts of, of broad leaves that your soil may yeah you know, that, your, 
Yeah, and that's the weeds are always telling you they want a warm season broadleaf, but I, we str I struggle to find an actual crop broadleaf. So those help me get that fourth species in there a lot of times. Yeah, and that's that's a great point. You know, if if you've got plants that your soil needs and you can't really grow it or don't want to grow it as a cash crop, make sure it's part of your cover crop mix. That's a great way to get it integrated into what you're doing there. So this is me drilling into a wheat double and I use a shellborn stripper head, um, which I th I think is pretty critical for when you're doing cover crops, especially when you're doing it immediately behind the combine. Um, you know, e even if you're, I, I think you can still do it with a sickle head, but it makes it very, very challenging to set the drill um, and cut through that fresh straw is is pretty hard in my experiences to cut through so the shellborn allows me to you know go right between the old wheat rows with my drill and i don't have so much trash on the ground and i can get better seed to soil contact with my uh, cover crop seed and generally i try and follow the combine the same day or the day after and you know don't give give my cover crop the best chance to get a head start on on anything and avoid having to to spray it because inevitably if you wait for the rain your weeds already got a head start on you because they're you yeah. know they're five days ahead of you and you got now you got moisture now you got to go plant but now you got you know mother nature already sprouted all your cover crop weeds in the in the soil so yeah dry wood i try to get it in as fast as i i can after the combine yep time timeliness is very important there for sure so here here's here's some uh, coming up on you. Yep. So yeah, that'd be a couple of weeks after just coming up through that wheat stubble, and you know, you could, it was a pretty clean field to begin with at harvest time there. So now, you know, this field has allowed me to, you know, I had a fallow period essentially there where the wheat dried down and took me a while to combine, but but you know, I'm changing that to four weeks instead of. 10 months, I guess. So now I'm, now I'm starting to build some more soil right here. Um, just some millets and buckwheat and brassicas kind of showing the diversity that's, that's put in there. Now, John, are you removing any of this through grazing or is this all just returning to the soil or do you have animals out there? Um, when I generally, for the most part, I just let it all grow and return to the soil, um, especially in our area. Um, you know, I'm, we're not out here. We're not going to get six foot tall cover crops after a wheat harvest and, you know, thousands of pounds of biomass. Um, so, you know, usually it's, it's not the, it's not the prettiest looking cover crop. Usually. I mean, it's, we're dry and um, it's hot in the summer. So, you know, I more look of it as the soil benefit and using the photosynthesis and, and trying to get that residue. So generally after wheat harvest, I have avoided grazing it unless it's a super yeah. prolific wet year and I can grow a ton of biomass and I can graze a little bit, but, you know, taking, even grazing it lightly and taking 50% of a little bit, you know, it's, it, Kind of dings you, I think, coming yep. up next year. Yeah. So, and and yeah, you understand the value of leaving it out there versus removing it. Tell us about this. Yeah, kind of when I first started, this was one of the earlier pictures, and you know, nine out of ten radishes I had would go sideways, and you could find that old plow pan where it goes sideways, and then try to find a place to go down and you know they'd eventually go down so early on when I started you know I'd always hit that plow pan and they'd push out two three feet out of the soil um, in these later years as I've done the cover crops and no-till you know I don't get so much of a push out of the soil I have a lot easier time getting down and in addition with the you know the fibrous roots too are just as important I think radish gets a lot of publicity but um, you need those smaller ones too like the sorghums and millets and stuff to break a path open for them as well yeah it's really important I remember one of the first years we did a cover crop we planted well part of the field we planted to just straight radishes and I mean they grew like crazy and we thought we were the best cover crop farmers in the world and 
till the next spring when those things started breaking down and yeah, it completely consumed all of our wheat straw and we had very bare ground in that area it's like oh yeah that yeah. that didn't help us you know be you know so it, it's all about having it in balance you want some radishes some deep tap roots but like you said the the sorghums and the millets and the other you know fibrous rooted systems are just as important and I, I've noticed that by um, growing the cover crop right after the cereal harvest, that um, it seems like the soil biology has something living to feed off, and it prioritizes that over the saprophytic of the of the roots and the stubble. And come springtime, when you um, drill that, generally the stubble stays up better it's kind of more springy like it was when you first drilled it as opposed mm -hmm. to when it before when it when i wasn't drilling cover crops you know it just breaks off right at the soil surface and um, especially out here you can risk you, you know losing a whole field of stripper straw if you break it off with your drill and get it yeah yeah, yeah we we've noticed that too it'll, it'll blow into big piles and especially that stripped stubble uh you know you can you can get a lot of piles but you know, when you drill through it, you've got a cover crop growing, it kind of stitches it all together, it ties it all together, and the yeah. residue is much easier to manage. So you got some things blooming here. Yeah, some buckwheat and red clover, and looks like a bunch of brassicas and some, maybe some mung beans there or something in the bottom. So just, you know, kind of, kind of showing the diversity of what you can get in the mix especially after summer harvest you know they're a pretty big opportunity you can look at the green cover catalog or wherever and you can pretty much plant any seed you want during the, that time of year so yeah. that kind of gives you a lot a lot more flexibility and a lot a lot of cool things you can do with those summer ones as opposed to you know just the fall where you're limited to cool seasons or or even the springtime when you can't get the warm seasons in there. Yep. Yeah, it's a great time of the year to plant a cover crop. I am today drilling a cover crop in the rye stubble. We're looking at what's already been drilled. You can see I'm splitting the rows of the rye, the old rye rows. Laying the seed right in between there. And we're going to go over here and show you what, what it looks like where it's been drilled and where it hasn't been drilled. Besides the combine track, you can hardly tell the drill's been through this field. So very low disturbance. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, a lot, I'd say, you know, one of my concerns is being out there with the drill is mowing down my residue, but um, by being there right away after harvest, the at least the cereals, they still kind of got a spring in their step and they kind of pop right back up after you run the drill through it. And, um, you know, with the GPS today and RTK, I have all my lines set up and I don't generally go at an angle or anything. I just, I'm on seven and a half inch spacing. I just, move my GPS line over three and a half or four inches and split the old split the old rows and I got narrow gauge wheels on that cedar so I I try and you know I got some extra tires in there on the drill putting putting residue down but otherwise my openers or anything aren't aren't putting much mm -hmm. residue on the ground and so this was this was the cereal grain. You got the cover crop planted into it, and then you'll go to a spring planted crop, most likely the the following spring. Yep, that's correct. Yeah, this was rye stubble, and I just have a planted mostly a warm season mix in there, and I'll have the some volunteer rye that'll come on later, and then some um, other winter ones like hairy vetch or winter peas. So then, you know, come springtime, I'd have the opportunity I could spray that out and plant peas or or a warm season crop like uh, buckwheat or millet or sunflowers or corn and that you know come you know maybe i'm planting millet into that field in 
you know, end of May. So maybe I have to terminate that in, in May, but first part of May to conserve some moisture out here and still have some to get the seeds up. But, you know, I just, yeah, at least had something growing from July till May and eliminated that fallow period to 30 days instead of 10 months. Yep. Yep. And I think one last picture here, uh, because this this tells a pretty good story right here. Go go ahead and share what this story is telling us. Yeah, um, I guess you know things I've noticed uh, over the years, and especially the last two or three years, is how um, my soil has significantly changed. And some of the fields that I'm farming, um, I remember farming those as a kid. Um, they've been in the family for a while and I remember you know working the ground and we'd get a one inch rain or whatever and have to go work summer fallow and we would always be driving around these little lagoons and out here in northeast Colorado it's it's pretty flat I mean these are like these these lagoons are sloped yeah but it's it's a very small slope and over, definitely over the last four years um I very, very rarely see water standing in my fields, and I very, very rarely even make a track um, with my drill or my combine, or, you know, I, I see other guys fighting mud with their combine, or, and I'm just driving through it all and not having a problem, and I think that's a direct result of having something living in the ground and photosynthesizing and building up my soil over the years. And just by taking a shovel and looking at it, and sometimes I go over the you know neighboring field, just you know maybe I don't remember what it looked like, or um, I was tr I have a new guy who's helping me farm, and we were drilling some oats this spring, and he you know he asked why I was doing this, why I was doing that, why do I have all this residue out here, and. We were out back checking the drill and checking the seeds and we were along kind of real close to the there was like 100 feet to walk over so i dug up a part of my soil and then he was checking the drill i ran over there and i still just borrowed some soil from the other field and i brought him over and i set him side by side and he's like holy cow i was like what where do you want your food grown or if you had a garden what which one would you grow your garden on and he's like yeah yours i was like yeah He's like that you do that in one year i was like no that's it's, it's <laughs> took a while so um you know especially in our area with the infiltration i've noticed that i can get the water in very very good and very very quickly um there's a um, guy came around last year from the nrcs and did the they were doing a training for the infiltration test with some of the employees and they said they had just come from a farm and it was a half inch an hour and they wanted to do mine and they when they when they finished it I think it took 12 minutes for the second inch and he said if if you can get around that 10 10 minutes you're doing doing really good and so it equated to six inches an hour and you know that you know I probably built a half inch an hour every year that I've been doing cover crops and no-till so because um, mm -hmm. there's times that you doubt yourself or you know just drive through the countryside and don't see necessarily everyone else doing what you're doing or wonder why you're doing what you're doing but you know it's kind of moments like that that reaffirm you know that this is why I'm doing it yeah look at that you know if I get if we get one of those gangbuster rains, you know, yet yeah, it took me seven years to build it, but you know, I might cash in on it this year. So, well, and you know, I do a lot of traveling, and everywhere I go, everybody agrees that the rainfall events are getting less frequent and more intense. And so, you know, we do tend to see those those bigger rains less often. And so, you're right. If you can't you can't get it in the ground and if you don't have the carbon in your soil to hold it then you're missing out and you're not going to have the benefit of that subsoil moisture to carry you through until the next rain so i think that's one of the reasons you're able to do what you're doing and it's one of the reasons why people struggle initially because 
you know, they're, they're not getting that infiltration and they don't have all those benefits. It adds up and it's incremental. And so kudos to you for hanging in there, you know, through some, some tough years uh, to get to the point where you're at now, where you've grown a tremendous amount of resiliency into your system uh, because of your diversity and your commitment to having plants growing and not having fallow out there. And so I uh, just want to thank you, John, for the, the time that uh, you shared with us here. And folks, if you haven't watched the webinar with Nicole Masters called The Fallow Fallacy, uh, make sure that you click on the link here and go watch that as well, because it all kind of ties together. Uh, what John is showing you that he's doing in his field, Nicole is kind of talking about in a bit more practical terms. So, John, any uh, closing thoughts or comments? Um, yeah, I was going to like, uh, um, I think it's, you know, when you first start, it's it's harder. You want to see those results right away and see how everything works. But I think it's, you know, it's a long game. You got to keep after it year after year and see those, like you said, those incre incremental improvements. And yeah, it'll eventually things kind of come together and start working better for you. And, um, you know, moist moisture wise, once your soil can, it's like you're growing your crops in this teeny little flower pot right now. And you had to grow a cover crop, you're going to use up all that moisture in that, that teeny little flower pot. But if you can grow that flower pot to get bigger and bigger and not evaporate so fast or hold more water, then you can eventually start doing different things or, or more things that, you know, might have not been possible before. Yeah, they won't work here or whatever when you first start, but as you incrementally get better and better, it opens up possibilities of things that you can do or different things you can do. Yeah, absolutely. So folks, if you're interested in some of the mixes that John planted, or you want to get some seed for your own ground to start building your soil up like John has done, uh, just give us a call or shoot us an email at greencoverseed.com. We'd be happy to help you. Uh, get to the point where you are no longer buying into the fallow fallacy as well. Thank you.